Hi guys, welcome back to another video. I know it's been a long time, but I'm finally going to delve into the glute science and I'm going to teach you all about the glutes and the best way to train them to achieve maximum booty building results. Glutes have the potential to be the biggest, strongest, most powerful muscle in the entire body. They need to have a lot more attention than what's given to them in a traditional training program. Also, as girls who are into fitness, we want our glutes proportionately bigger. We don't mind growing some quads and hamstrings along the way, but usually our end result is going to be glutes that are slightly out of proportion. If we want them proportionally bigger, we need to train them proportionately more. Big glutes also allow us to avoid injury. They help us build a strong, balanced base that aids us in everyday activity as well as regular exercise. Back in the Paleolithic days, we used to be much more active people. Our lifestyle now includes a lot of sitting, not very much activity, and unless you're an athlete, you're not going to be doing like sprinting, jumping, etc. things that will activate the glutes. Disuse, neglect, sitting, 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 our entire lives for school, for work, this causes the glutes to lose blood supply, they're gonna atrophy, they're gonna lose neural input. <sighs> what can happen is what Stu McGill calls glute amnesia, meaning that the nerves coming from our brain to tell our glutes to turn on just die away. It's obviously going to make the glutes disproportionately weak and other muscles are going to overwork to compensate for the glutes. So when you're first starting your glute training, telling the glutes to wake up is really difficult. And expecting them to automatically recruit maximally during squats and deadlifts is just really unlikely. You can't just walk into the gym, start squatting, and then expect your peach to balloon as much as the majority of trainers and coaches want you to believe. So because hypertrophy research, particularly glute specific hypertrophy research is such a new branch in an already very limited field of research, Thank you, Brett Contreras, for progressing this field. You can't just take the current research as a be all and end all that dictates exactly how we train our glutes. It's very important to supplement this research with actual experience, actually going to the gym and actually training glutes and seeing results that happen over years. These are the type of people who can help actually provide some insight. Brett, for example, has trained clients over years. He's gathered anecdotal evidence from his clients, and that is actually how he gets new ideas to study and research. Brett Contreras himself has said in response to, what is the best glute exercise? In order to confidently answer, I need there to exist approximately 20 high quality training studies, longitudinal studies that compared the gluteal hypertrophic gains between various exercises using different combinations of glute exercises and using different types of subjects. This research does not exist. <laughs> The glutes require special attention in order to fire during exercises. It is essential that we <laughs> One, choose exercises that encourage proper glute recruitment, i.e. doing glute specific exercises or ones that are modified to better target the glutes. Train glutes at least two times per week as part of a properly composed lower body routine that includes progression. Make sure that you feel the exercise in your glutes. We all have different anatomy, different limb segment lates, different muscle insertion points. So slight adjustments to better suit our bodies and glutes is really important and it's totally okay. It's important to prehabilitate with glute activation drills to get the glutes properly warmed up and firing before you actually start. This will help you get the most out of your workout, especially if you have really stubborn glutes. And then finally, glute training is as much of a mental workout as it is a physical one. You need to really, really concentrate on activating your glutes. Like they're probably not working if A, you can't feel them, or you're not concentrating. Like you really have to put a lot of mental effort into it to get used to actually turning them on. And then once you're used to that, then it won't be so much of a mentally intense type of thing. Concentrate and mindfully engage. That's my motto. The earlier you are in your glute training career, the more specific exercises need to be to glutes. Maximizing hip range of motion while reducing knee range of motion is very helpful for people who find it difficult to activate glutes and or if they're quad dominant. And like I said, over time, 
the mind muscle connection and the conscious effort to recruit the glute becomes easier and activating the glute during regular old squats and deadlifts becomes a lot more natural and simpler. It personally took me over a year to get there and that wasn't a year into my training career. That was like three years into my training career and then when I switched to a specific glute focus. So when I was powerlifting, I actually forgot how to mindfully engage my glutes, especially because for my powerlifting training, because of my forward lean and my squat, I was really focusing on quads. So I made myself into a very quad dominant person and it took a lot of time after that to actually switch over mentally to activating and engaging the glute. There is hope if you feel like your glutes just cannot work. When I wrote my glute training program that I ran through for over a year, it gave me amazing results. It's the one that I have available now. A lot of you guys have probably already bought it, so thank you. Um, but if you haven't, then definitely check it out. It's a very science-based program and it's consistent with everything that I've talked about in this video. So next, I'm going to go through a little tiny bit of glute anatomy and a little bit of biomechanics as they pertain to glutes. So first off, I'm gonna start with the anatomy. The glutes are made up of three muscles, the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, and the gluteus maximus. The gluteus medius lies right below the gluteus maximus on the outer surface of the pelvis. The muscle originates on the ilium, particularly the anterior and the posterior gluteal line. The fibers of the muscle group together and they converge into a tendon that inserts on the lateral side of the very top of the femur, so the little like bulby bone part of the femur, which is called the greater trochanter. Now the gluteus minimus it's pretty much a mini version of the gluteus medius I haven't heard that written anywhere but it's the conclusion that I came to it's the innermost glute muscle that lies immediately below the gluteus medius it also originates on the ilium and inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur the gluteus minimus and medius have the exact same movement functions they're also the most powerful hip abductors and internal rotators all of the muscle fibers in each medius and minimus work for abduction Internal rotation is just the anterior fibers of each muscle. Hip extension is the posterior fibers. External rotation is the posterior fibers again. And the glute medius and minimus both contribute towards the stabilization of the hip. It's also important to note that the posterior fibers of the gluteus medius fire much better when the hip is internally rotated. Now on to our favorite, the gluteus maximus. So the gluteus maximus is just hands down the largest muscle in the body, or it should be when it's not H feed and it's the most superficial glute muscle. It is the most important by far in the appearance and the shape of the glutes. The gluteus maximus has kind of a wide fan of fibers and they originate at the ilium, so the pelvis, the sacrum and the coccyx, the base of the spine and the tailbone, and also from various fascia and ligaments, so lumbar, thoracolumbar, columbar, and gluteus medius fascia. So the vast majority of the gluteus maximus fibers group together, converge, and stretch diagonally across the hip and end in a thick tendinous lamina, which inserts into the femur via the IT band, and a much smaller proportion of deeper, glute max fibers actually insert directly onto the femur at the gluteal tuberosity, I believe. So as you can see from the diagram, the fibers are directed downward and lateral word, so away from the midline. They are shaped kind of like a hand fan, like you know the as for the hip movements of the gluteus maximus, its most powerful one by far in terms of torque is hip extension, but it also does external rotation. The upper fibers contribute to hip abduction. The lower fibers contribute minimally to hip adduction. The glute max also tilts the pelvis posteriorly, so posterior pelvic tilt, stabilization of the hip, and since it inserts into the IT band, force transfer allows it to stabilize the knee as well. Today we're going to focus mostly on gluteus maximus with a small little touch on the gluteus medius. The glute max is just overwhelmingly the most important of the glute muscles. It's the one that's actually going to like grow and show. Whereas the gluteus medius, obviously you don't want to ignore it and it's great for hip stabilization, etc. And it will help round out your butt a little bit. It should not be made the main focus. It's, it just wouldn't be as important. The gluteus maximus is the strongest as a hip extensor and a hip external rotation 
rotator. And this is really easy to imagine by the way that the fibers run. So back to that diagram, the gluteus maximus is line of force. So the average of all of the fiber lines is directed approximately 45 degrees. A little bit of basic trigonometry gives the result that 71% of the glutes force will actually be in the horizontal plane, which means it's a very strong hip external rotator. If the fibers all contracted of their own accord, the hip would simultaneously extend, abduct, and externally rotate. Through my own experience and research, I've found a combination of these movements to be incredible for targeting the glutes and activating them during training. Okay, so let's move on to biomechanics. Any loading or exercises that cause us to resist hip flexion, i.e. straighten out our hips, qualifies as a glute exercise. So all squat, hip thrust, deadlift, lunge, kickback variations, all qualify as glute exercises. So some definitions, hip extension, range of motion, or ROM is the degrees of angle that the hips move through during an exercise. It's really important when you're imagining hip range of motion, you want to try to ignore what the knees are doing. It doesn't matter whether they're bent or straight, we're just looking specifically at the hip joint. Maximizing hip range of motion while minimizing knee range of motion reduces quad involvement. So this is important for people who are quad dominant or people who just struggle to activate their glutes in general. When the hips are flexed, the glutes are in a stretch position. And alternatively, when the hips are extended, the glutes are in a shortened position. A full range of hip extension with the force always acting perpendicular on the hips would be ideal. However, we're limited by equipment, by how practical it is to do a certain exercise, as well as how we load the weight on our bodies when we're actually performing the exercise. So I'm gonna run through a couple of examples, just like typical glute exercise examples. So first off, we're gonna talk about the squat. As you can see, the squat has a really nice range of motion for the hips, especially the deeper that you go in the squat. But of course, the deeper you go in the squat, the more knee flexion you're going to have as well. The loading of the squat is always acting parallel to the hips, so this is important to note. So the maximum tension on the glutes is going to be at the bottom of the squat to the parallel point. Um, and then anything up from there, the tension goes down and down as the loading is exerting less and less of a torque on the hips. At the top, it's going to be the absolute minimum tension on the glute, virtually zero. However, when we look at a hip extension, the range of motion is, it's okay, it's mediocre. The hips might not even flex to 90 degrees, but it's a really great exercise in other regards. The loading is always perpendicular to the hip. This means that when we're contracting our glutes, we're always working directly against that weight. So the maximum tension on the glutes is going to be at the top of the exercise. So when our hips are fully locked out and the tension is going to go down as we descend in the hip thrust, it will go to zero if you let the weight hit the ground. However, if you hold the weight hovering above the ground, then you can still keep some tension on the glutes and it's pretty even top to bottom. But what makes the hip thrust an excellent exercise is that the glutes fire the strongest at full hip extension. And like I said, the maximum tension on the glutes is always at the top in the hip thrust. So whether you're using bands or a barbell or whatever, you're really maximizing what the glutes can do fully contracted. You can imagine that it's really good to do isolation holds at the top. Hopefully my going through those two examples helps you understand and visualize how we have to look at the pros and the cons of each exercise and how modifying them slightly to change them in a way that might better exert more force or tension on the glutes can be really helpful in improving them. By choosing exercises intelligently, we can come up with a workout or a program that covers all of the bases. All right guys, so that's it for this video. The next video is going to be the actual workout portion. I just decided to split them up, otherwise it would be way too long and I just wanted to go into all of the relevant information as I always do. The next video is going to be the actual workout routine as I mentioned and I'm going to run through all of the exercises, why I chose them, um, the biomechanics of the exercises, etc. how many reps and sets to do. That has already been recorded so that's just going to be up in the next couple of days. So make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and don't forget to subscribe and be notified when the next video comes out. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. 
Bye.